great. So yeah, whenever you're ready, I think. All right, thank you. Uh, thanks for everyone. We're going to go ahead and call our uh, meeting to order. I want to thank everyone for being here on the afternoon. Uh, and what we're going to do first is do a roll call. And then after that, we'll kind of do an overview for the meeting. So Michael, I don't know if you're pulling uh, all shifts today. If you are, then if you could go ahead and go through the roll. And folks, if you're here, uh, please let us know by verbally stating. And if you're participating by uh, Teams video, or if you're just in on by phone. Uh, so Senator Przanski. Here by Teams video. Uh, Rep Morgan. Present by video. Uh, Tyler Bechtel. Tyler's trying to get Pre unmuted. <laughs> Present uh, by video. Uh, Rob Bovet. Uh, I'm here on the Teams call. Josh Eastman. Here by video and audio. Uh, Dave Factor for DOJ. Uh, Dave Factor for OJD. Um, I'm here on the Teams video. Apologies, Dave. Uh, Jake Johnstone. I am here by Teams video and audio is the phone number ending in one three for everyone. Uh, Aaron Seiler. Yes, I'm here by a video. Uh, Kurt Miller. Present by Teams video. Uh, Courtney Moran. Courtney Moran present by Teams video. Just my camera's not working. Uh, Nathan Sickler. I don't see him, Chair. Um, Amanda right. Swanson. I don't see them either. And then uh, Scott Winkles. And I'm not seeing him either. All right. I just jumped off another meeting with him, so maybe he can join soon. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. <laughs> Uh, what we have at this point is our meeting overview. As you, if you had an opportunity to look at the agenda, we're really going to focus on a couple of uh, areas that we had uh, issued or let's say had laid out as issues and potential quick fixes to help. Uh, we're going to, uh, before we do that, we are going to kind of just go through the uh, subcommittee potential topic list. That's attached at least what we have started at this point. Uh, and I would, uh, uh, Michael's going to help me go through what and how we're going to address this stuff. And I think this is also the time, as Rob Ovet uh, suggested before we went live, uh, that he has heard from some individuals as to maybe some other topics. This is a time for us to be able to capture those topics and uh, ideas that people may have. So uh, Michael can make some notes. Of course, we got, and I should just state that this meeting is being recorded for everyone. Uh, so please keep that in mind, uh, but we'll be able to take those lists and then start, uh, uh, I guess, parsing out what we think we can do and when we can get to it uh, with the understanding of trying to take the low hanging fruit that will be something that we should be able to get prepped and ready to go and hopefully some additional items uh, for the 2023. And then if we are not complete at that point, we'll be able to uh, continue the work of this work group uh, task force into a the ability of uh, 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 I guess continuation of work for the next what would be short session in 2024. So Michael, what I've got here is uh, the subcommittees, and so I guess what I should be doing is asking for those who have ideas and suggestions. First, you may want to look at the attachment that Michael has put together. Uh, this is our task force on cannabis derivative and uh, intoxicants and illegal uh, cannabis production uh, with the topics and actions proposed by subcommittee members. So uh, these are ones we captured already and they've already put them into uh, a, I'm going to call it a grid chart, but a chart table that actually gives the topic uh, action that's being proposed, some comments and disposition as to where we're at uh, for uh, putting that onto the agenda. So we've got the first two that are here are actually what we will be dealing with in the remainder of our 
uh, meeting today after we get through scoping other topics. The last, uh, I guess, thing I want to say is that I know that we're currently scheduled to go to 4.15. Uh, I'm going to need to shut us down at by 4 o'clock, so we have about an hour and five minutes to get through our materials today. Uh, questions from anybody before we uh, jump into other uh, suggested topics? All right, not seeing anyone raise hands or voice. I want to just make certain I am staying on top of everything. So, Michael, I'm going to ask you, you and I did not go over this this morning. Did you want to go through the list that we have here, the attachment uh, as to what those topics are first, or did you want to uh, open it up for a new and additional ones? Chair, I, I was just thinking I, we'd open it up for comments from members, just a kind of high level, okay. either either things they want to add or um, topics that are on the list that they think should be prioritized. Um, okay. I know this list. I, I this list, you know, is came from members, so I don't want to I don't want to speak for them or um, you know try and summarize things that folks are much more knowledgeable about than right. I am. All right, Michael, thank you. And he, Michael, you've uh, has also uh, you know, reminded me one of the things that we've talked about right now is really gathering potential topics uh, at a, let's call it a 50,000 foot level, not going into a lot of detail. This is basically just scoping ideas out and then we can go into the two that we're going to be addressing today will be much more into the weeds of the uh, uh, of the actual topics. Uh, but right now, let's just go through the uh, the uh, list that we have on the execution of warrants. Like I said, that's going to be uh, what we'll be working on today and also the judicial uh, procedure on increasing judicial availability or uh, test to, uh, territorial authority, authority, I guess is what that says. And so resources, uh, I've got resources hyphen staffing uh, and that is standing on its own at this point as uh, increasing the number of law enforcement positions uh, is uh, some of the areas ensuring st uh, sustainability of funding uh, to meet the county uh, needs and exploring uh, DA support. So is there anything else that would be kind of in the resource arena besides those three uh, subtopics? All right, I'm going to jump down to other law enforcement topics. Uh, seizure, uh, forfeiture of tools, equipment and uh, property is one. Uh, also seizure uh, reports, and I'm assuming this is be able, as it says, to create more of a clearinghouse or consolidated place for those reports on the seizures that occur. Is there other topic or subtopics that would fit into that general arena that people want to raise. And Chair, I'll just note there are uh, three more on the next page as well that kind of are within that subtopic area. Yes, they are. As I scroll down, I see the other three, which is investigative tools, uh, deterrence slash penalties and water crimes and coordination. So that gives us five within that uh, subject area. Uh, are there other ones that people think would also be or should be included within these uh, topic of other law enforcement? All right, Jake, I see your hand up. Go for it. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Senator Trezanski. Uh For the record, Jake Johnstone, Oregon Water Resource Department. Uh, the last line there, water crimes coordination, I would just propose rewording to be natural resource coordination. Um, specifically, what we're curious about is, is there a more effective way to coordinate with our law enforcement partners when it comes to these shared cases in the illicit production market where they're not registered with anyone? Uh, currently, we have a system in place where it's very case by case, depending on the county or area of the state. Uh, it's my understanding law enforcement has on their side uh, a system, a database, for lack of a better word, on how they coordinate on some of these sites. Um, I'm just wanting to see if there's any way for us to be more effective in being, a, you know, a coordinating partner with law enforcement on that. All right, Jake, thank you. So that's clarification. I saw Michael taking some notes, so we'll re-ID uh, that as to what it is intended, which would be much broader than just uh, criminal 
conduct type of activities or how to uh, get enforcement. So with that said, Rob, I'm going to go ahead and jump to you uh, since you already mentioned that you had a couple other topics that uh, seems like it would be above and beyond what we've captured so far. Actually, the topics that I talked to um, other members about were within these boxes. I was just okay. wondering what how what process we were going to use to kind of filter and further flesh them out because right now they're pretty generic and I uh, at least some of them are pretty generic and I I don't know that I or LC could craft anything off this, so we would need more explanation, you know. OK, uh, so regarding the areas, are we, you know, knowing that we're going to be going into the areas uh, surrounding the execution of warrants uh, and the judicial procedure, are, are, do they fit within that, those boxes or the yeah, others? Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much because we're, you know, if you look at your second box, explore possible revisions to ORS 133-545, and, and, and I understand that, and that gets, that's where it gets really complicated, of course, but we also had talked earlier about um, different penalty levels, and I don't know if that was still going to be, um, you know, up for discussion. I know the sheriff had mentioned, for example, um, and in fact, he's right there, never mind, um, had talking about really um, and I understand why overall we drop crime levels and sanctions for most drug offenses. But, you know, for the folks that we've been talking about here, it's really, I mean, it's drug trafficking organizations doing real high level stuff. And so really there isn't any state real penalties to go after that. And I don't know if we're supposed to be talking about that or, or fleshing that out even more. But that was one of the issues that I talked to a couple people about they were wondering. All right. Uh, I guess in response to your question inquiry, I think those are things for, uh, to be considered and in going into greater detail as to yep. how we would want to flush it out and uh, what and how broad we want to go. I mean, clearly within these topics, I can see stuff that will be, let's call it low hanging fruit and other stuff that may be a little bit more complex, uh, needing more discussions and uh, and such. But uh, you know, I'm open to having this uh, done through our process now through this, this particular subcommittee, or if we want to have con call it breakout groups within the subcommittee to take on the topics. Uh, you know, it's one of those things that it's probably would be best if we can have some uh, pre work done before we get into the subcommittee discussions. So it may be best to have someone taking a lead and being a presenter uh, when we kind of really dive into some of this stuff uh, to already have, uh, let's say, started a charted route for us to get to the uh, information and discussion uh, basis. Does anyone have any other suggestions besides what I've just suggested as a way to try to unravel the different areas and have the broader discussions? All right, so Rob, besides what you've mentioned, is there others that you want to just put on the record so we can uh, ensure that I'll ask other members uh, the same question? No, not really. That was the only one I didn't see on the list, but um, it's more me listening and hearing and, and talking about the other ones too, because as you mentioned, Senator, some of these just need to be talked through and fleshed out a bit more, okay. including the criminal sanctions. We need. I think we need to talk through that. I think we the sheriff raised it, but I don't think we've talked through that one or the warrant one quite enough. Um, now, the warrant one's going to get real complicated, but but the criminal sanction one, I think is pretty straightforward in terms of the crafting and the legal issues. It's about the policy. Okay. This is this is Courtney. Rob, is is what you're talking about on the last page deterrence penalties? Or exactly. is that something different? Yeah. Oh, that exactly. is. The one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so so I guess that is generically listed as well. I just we need to flesh all that out or decide we're not going to do it or decide we're going to do it. You know, that's what I was saying, basically. OK, just want to check. <clears throat> all right. Any other comments on uh, what we've put on the table so far? All right, if not, then I think we're going to go ahead and jump into the next portion of the agenda. Uh, this is under our sub three, which is warrant discussions. 
uh, and the first sub A and actually sub B, both of them are, we're going to be, be relying on Sergeant Bechtel to kind of give us the overview. So the first one is sub A is execution of warrant, allowing additional resource staff on site. Uh, and so Sergeant, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and maybe uh, give us a little bit more of an overview, and then I want to open that up for discussion. And based on our timing, let's see if we can do this within about a 25 to 30 minute period, leaving about the equal amount of time for the second area. Perfect. Thank you, Chair Przanski. For the record, Tyler Bechtel with the Oregon State Police. I'm going to share a couple of slides with you just so you can see uh, the text of the, the statute that I'm uh, specifically talking about is my screen up there. Are you guys seeing a slideshow? Yes, we can see it. OK, so we're talking about the execution of search warrants and assisting law enforcement. I'm just going to kind of set the foundation of this question and why I brought it up to begin with. We're, what we're really talking about here is um, ORS 133575 execution of a warrant. And um, this this uh, to be more specific, this last sentence there. So a police officer charged with its execution may be accompanied by such other persons as may be reasonably necessary for the successful execution of the warrant with all practical safety. So uh, two interpretations there. I can bring anyone reasonably necessary for a successful execution or and I need to make sure that they're safe or the people I'm bringing um, I need to bring uh, uh, for the safety of, of the personnel on scene. So that's kind of um, the more conservative approach. That's the one that I've taken. We have a current workaround. Um, you know, kind of the kind of the basis of this is we're we're discovering, you know, frankly, life safety issues that uh, we might need a fire marshal, a public utility, a power company to look at for us it's just so we can go in. And then we also have a due regard to to, you know, uh, and neutralize those issues uh, uh, when we leave. I would hate to leave uh, a hazardous condition that starts a forest fire and we all know what that is. So um, our current workaround right now, uh, uh, of course, you know everything that uh, that we seek to do with a search warrant. We have to lay a foundation, a basis of knowledge, um, and explain to a judge why we want it. So, um, in the affidavit, our our affiants are um, uh, asking for people employed by regulatory agencies and power utilities acting under the direction of a police officer to assist with assessments related to the safety of the location search. So that's uh, that's what we're doing um, in the warrant. Uh, we're getting the judge to uh, um, authorize us to to bring those people. Um, moving on, uh, what's the need? Uh, again, I went through power companies. Uh, I can see public utility districts, both power and water. Um, you know, the facts are we just do not have the expertise to know if um, you know something leaking into a water body is something that's going to cause a, a public health problem. We don't know um, electrical and building codes. We don't know county code compliance. Um, uh, we could see uh, issues with uh, um, uh, uh, water, uh, water rights. Uh, um, there was, I've, I've seen fish stuck in water pumps, you know, things like that, that, that I know is got to be illegal, but I don't know how to address it without my regulatory partners. I'm thinking um, DEQ and uh, I put it down even the dog catcher there. Um, so does law enforcement bring other people onto the property now? Would we bring the dog catcher? Absolutely. Do we bring tow truck operators? Absolutely. Are we covered? Uh, it's up for debate. Uh, there are municipalities, um, there are public utility districts, both public and private uh, uh, power companies that say, no, we're not coming there unless unless you show us that that we're in your warrant and we're authorized to be there. So um, that's the need. Uh, what we can't do, uh, I don't think, is um, allow for the search seizure or analyzing of any objects that are not authorized in our search warrant. An example of that, I believe, would be water and soil samples. So 
um, we would have to lay that foundation in our affidavit. Um, but uh, I would still like to have someone from DEQ there with me or a watermaster saying, uh, hey, um, uh, I'm here present. I have my regulatory authority and my expertise, and I'm telling you that this is a big issue for public safety for for whatever reason. So um, the uh, that's kind of that's kind of um, where where we're at uh, with the problem. Um, a, a discussion I think that that it's worth having as we go through this is uh, regulatory agency views or learns of something in a violation of of rules. Um, I think you know they're legally allowed to be in a place. Let's say, for instance, um, we're on um, a registered uh, uh, hemp site, and we are finding um, uh, maybe maybe a a, a plat uh, of of hemp that's that's you know the GPS doesn't match up. That's something for for um, uh, ODA to take care of. That's not something that that we're necessarily going to know. Um, I can think of a couple other examples, but I think uh, discussion by everyone else might uh, might flesh this out a little bit more, and that's kind of the foundation for uh, this issue. All right, Sergeant, thank you very much for giving that overview. I, you know, at this point, I guess what we should do is, you know, this is not my expertise uh, as to how the language should be written. It does seem like some clarity into the statute uh, 133.575 is warranted uh, to give a little bit more explicitness because it sounds from what I'm hearing it depending on the jurisdiction you're in some of them may be more quote unquote liberal and uh, stating who is part of that group versus on a more conservative side uh, since it's not spelled out so let me open this up for some discussion and I guess my thoughts and questions are should we be looking at a uh, a, a longer list or some type of uh, mechanism that would embed into the statute who those uh, other officials could be, uh, or do we want to kind of have it a little bit more, uh, uh, I guess, open for, I hate to say interpretation, but one that doesn't try to proscribe the actual individual agencies or individuals uh, so I'll throw that out and look for comments and questions. I see Courtney, it looks like your hands up. Yeah, I had a question for Tyler. I just want to clarify the scope. Uh, it's specifically about the physical people who would be accompanying you, not trying to broaden the scope of what you're actually searching and seizing beyond the what's actually authorized in the warrant. Because just your last slide created some confusion yep. for me. Yeah, I'm sorry if it uh, created some confusion uh, a couple of slides prior. I said what we can't do is, is search, seize, or analyze anything that we didn't ask for in the affidavit, and I'm not looking to change that or broaden the search. I'm I'm looking to to clarify who we can take with us. Can I bring a code compliance person with me um, every time I, I go there? Um, uh, not to search for anything, but to advise us. Um, I would argue that they're reasonably necessary. And I think, um, you know, I was trying to wrap my head around this and bring it to you guys. Um, I think if you went back to that statute and you just removed the last few words um, that said for for all practical safety, it'd be much clearer because then law enforcement can take anyone necessary, uh, uh, for, anyone reasonably necessary for the successful execution of a search warrant. And and just striking those words, I think, would, would help. I see nods to this. Uh, Joshua, thank you for uh, giving me your, your body language there. Why don't you give me a little bit more, and then what I want to do is come back on to, uh, you know, the issue when these individuals are with you, I'm assuming they're completely under the control of the officer executing the warrant. They're not free to just start walking around and doing what they want to. They have to be under the control and directive of the officer that's doing the uh, execution of the warrant. Yeah, that would be my understanding of how we would advise them. 
I was nodding because a an ex, a list results in who we can't have, so we never know. Like if in a different case, if it's not included, then we're in a position. Oh, you're not included. Whereas cutting out those qualifiers to reasonably just stopping at warrant. And then we could address it based on the type of grow who we think based on my training experience investigating indoor grows it's helpful to have somebody from a utility or pacific power or whoever to advise on such and such or outdoor in a rural area i may need water resources that because then that's how i it would be safer that way just from reading it i think all right so nate before i go to you let me just get clarification on that josh what i'm taking away from that is that in the uh, affidavit for the warrant you would be laying those things out and then when the judge is reviewing it he or she knows basically who potentially in the sense of what entities might be uh, uh accompanying the officer as compared to the officer after getting the warrants and oh i'm going to take this person that person whoever right. that hasn't been judicially reviewed right based on training experience and nature of grow you could probably come up with some boilerplate that like we have it that you know it molds and got to be destroyed but you also like it's an outdoor grow these are done with often impromptu piece together electricity some therefore it's a rural area we may want a fire marshal or somebody with us yeah i think that we okay. could do it that way all right nate you're muted at least uh, you're not coming through. Uh, Chair, are you? Yeah. Oh. Michael, what's, uh, it, it, did we mute Nate from our end? No, he's a, uh, his, his uh, micro, it, he shows as he should be able to talk. So I don't know, maybe, can you, can you log off and log back on or? Okay. While uh, we're going through that process, I see Kurt, uh, your hand just went up. Why don't you go ahead? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'll kind of just echo Sergeant Bechtel and uh, Mr. Eastman there. Um, I I agree that when uh, a judge is reviewing the warrant, an officer should put in there that he would like to have the assistance of other people. I, I don't think we should limit that even on the face of the warrant to specific people, or certainly not in the statute or on the face of the warrant, because what if they get there and then they realize, oh gosh, now is when I realize we need the soil and water people. So I, I do like the concept and I don't think officers should be kind of, you know, arbitrary when they decide whether or not to bring someone, but I, I don't think we should also constrain that need for the safety um, based on the affidavit and the warrant. Second piece is, um, supporting the idea that we shouldn't have a limitation in the statute is this is obviously used outside of the context of marijuana cases, right? If we do a DUI case, we're going to we're going to use a nurse to take a blood sample on it, right? Or a, a somebody else. So it, it's a good idea to keep it, the terminology that we use that's reasonably necessary because that allows it to be expanded to other cases where other personnel are reasonably necessary. Um, the all practical safety part of it, I think, you know, if memory serves me, this came out of the the days of cops, right, where they used to let the uh, the news crew come in while they were serving a warrant on the cop show, and that kind of frustrated legislatures across the state, and that led to the kind of promulgation of things like this, saying, hey, don't bring the news people in there, that's that's not fair, and, and it's, it's completely appropriate to have a limitation on it. Um, and I do think the language should be sufficient if we just simply remove with all practical safety, but I still have concerns about uh, whether that would be interpreted to mean just the execution, meaning just getting onto the property, or does it also include the search, um, uh, the analysis, et cetera. And so I think that the language should be expanded to include uh, the reasonable, the successful execution, you know, search, seizure analysis um, as of the warrant, because that's really what it comes down to when you're talking about the execution of the warrant for a blood draw. I don't exactly need the uh, nurse there to just execute the warrant. I need the nurse there to do the search, to, to stick the needle in the person's arm and take the blood for it. So however we could phrase it to, to make sure we include all phases of it, I, I think that would be something that clears it up. And that's, as Sergeant Bechtel points out, something that's not only um, 
brought up frequently by the courts and the jurisdictions. It's brought up by the entities that are being assisted. Like most nurses are like, yeah, I get that it's listed in the statute, but I don't feel comfortable unless the judge puts it on the face of the warrant. So um, I think that we should be uh, clear that they're covered under the officer safety uh, kind of necessary. Uh, I'm sorry, the officer safety need. I just got to figure out how we would be able to not make them a full on agent of the officer, but to, that they would be subject to the guidance of the officer, right? Because we don't want to have officers be able to tell nurses to do things that they wouldn't be able to do within their own standards and the same thing for water safety boards. So within the guidance of the officers, but but not at the exact direction of the officers. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, I, I, I understand that. So I'm, I, I see, uh, uh, Sheriff, you're back with us, Nate, and yeah, also Tyler right. had your hand. I'm going to go with Nate first and then we'll come back with Tyler. Can you hear me okay now? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, my only concern, and I might have missed this, was just the 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 bringing people along. I just don't want to blur the lines between, you know, if we find additional criminal activity, you know, whether that's say theft of power, theft of water, which now have more serious criminal imp implications. You know, if if those aren't spelled out in the warrant, we're going to have to stop, maybe write additional warrants, diff uh, additional affidavits. And so that's my, I guess, if we're explaining that to the committee is bringing people along who generally work in the administrative field and then look for things that might be administrative violations. And then we in turn find criminal stuff. It would that convolute it? And my question was to Josh originally, or, may or maybe Sergeant Bechtel, uh who who do this a little more than i do haven't done it in a few years so um what are what are the concerns there tyler we'll let you go with the with the response and also what she wanted to engage with sure yeah um i i think i think there is that danger of convoluting it but um you know we're already in that position where where if we find something that's that's you know outside the scope of the warrant where we're going to have to 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 stop and, and probably get an amendment. So um, uh, really, you know, Kurt brought something up, and and it, it thank you, Mr. Miller, for uh, you know, pointing out about nurses taking blood. I, I think this is um, you know one of the things that that uh, we have to do a lot is we have these uh, these orange phototronics machines there. They're basically field testing units, um, and we're using it to differentiate between um, different types of cannabis. Um, well, very few teams have those. They're fourteen thousand dollars a piece, but OLCC has a bunch. So I need that machine. I my warrant allows me to search, seize, and analyze this cannabis. I need that machine. I need someone that has that training. I want to bring OLCC on to to assist me. Um, it's kind of like when we write a warrant for a phone, um, you know, oftentimes a police officer isn't downloading that phone. It's a it's a forensic uh, expert that's doing it. So um, uh, I I understand, um, Sheriff, your your concerns about convoluting it, and um, I certainly don't want to do that. I just want a little bit more leeway. This all practicable safety thing. Uh, is is really where the debate is hinging on in my experience. And um, uh, Chair Przanski, you mentioned that, yeah, we, we're still calling these people out often in the warrant. Um, uh, but, but at the same time, yes, you don't know. It's like Christmas. You don't know what's inside that present until you open it. And sometimes maybe that's too late to get a hold of the water resources guy or, um, uh, yeah, so... That's just my comments there. OK, and did you have other comments or, or did you capture everything you wanted to put I on the table? Wrapped it all up into one there. OK, excellent. I love it. Efficiency. Uh, so, uh, you know, Rob's off the phone already. And for those who don't know, I rely on Rob a lot to start doing draft language. Uh, since he's written so much over the years and as he and I have worked together on multiple issues uh, specifically around cannabis. So we're going to kind of put a little work group or I should say work group, a worksheet together. And Rob's going to be the uh, recipient of that. And this will be the first one. 
and just getting him to take the, uh, away from what we had here as it as simple as just taking away that last phrase or and or what else should we be adding into it to uh, be a little bit more inclusive uh, and ensuring that we get uh, enough there. That will give us uh, something when we come back to this topic uh, of something with a bit more meat on, in, uh, on the bone to uh, really look at and to, um, uh, to determine whether that's sufficient or not. And then we could put that into our uh, package for the 2023. I mean, these are the type of things that I think myself and represent, uh, Representative Morgan have been wanting to do is get through the process where y'all are getting hung up in execution of the warrants and not having the ability to have the resources there that you need and want, want and need, let's say that way. Uh, Lily, I see you got your hand up. Yes, sir. Thank you. I'm sorry. I am. Um, I got a couple things going on, so I'm trying to pay best attention I can. But the question I have that came up in the last meeting was. Uh, you can only because it's so much work involved, so intensive to get the warrant that you can essentially just get one a week. Um, and what I'm finding is people in our area are anticipating. We know which day warrants are served. We know it takes one a week. Oh, they got that one. We're free and clear this week. Uh, the ability to kind of work around the system. And I was trying to understand why is it just one a week? Can it be more? Is it just a matter of manpower? Is it a matter of um, if that could be a topic that we can get a little bit more information on? All right, we'll do that. I'm going to put that onto the parking lot list for future. What I see here as to what we're got going on, once we get the warrant, uh, um, we have it being executed. They're on the scene. They now realize, oops, you know, the warrant may not be clear enough to do this or that. I would assume there would be a, somewhat of a more expedited process since we're already there. We've already set the establishment. Now we're just going back and asking uh, for the judge to expand the scope of that warrant based on the PC uh, that's been found while they're there. Is that uh, a fair statement? Nate, you're kind of giving me a yay or nay. Yeah, it, that is actually a fair statement, um, but I think it's just the the time of of that process that might be a little misunderstood. So just for instance, in, in, in our county, um, it's a pretty big county with a lot of rural areas and we have a, some cell phone coverage and, you know, Wi-Fi out in the rules, but not always. And so, you, you know, you could look at worst case scenario of having to drive back to the office while you secure the scene, generate your your second piece of the, the affidavit and the new warrant, which is essentially an add on to your prior or, a, a, you know, addendum but outline why you now want to do these things. So we executed said, we went into and observed X, Y, Z, and based on my training experience, these are all, you know, crimes or whatnot. And so, right. you know, that could be, it could be a 30 to 40 minute process if everything goes well on a phone and you could do a telephonic warrant and you have a judge available and that's already kind of, maybe you had a pre-plan for that, or it could be another half a day, just depending on what's going on. So I think that's just the, the caveat there, and that might help, you know, uh, Representative Morgan with some part of her question as well, is some of these things can be just very time consuming to generate the paperwork and get a judge signature, and it just depends on, I don't think, Josephine County, do you have telephonic warrants yet in Joe County? I know we do here, but I didn't know if Joe County did that yet. We do for, we have templates for DUIs and other uh, auto exceptions and sometimes addendums for like you're saying hey we're out here but we have even sparser areas with service so it's at least a drive back to somewhere with service and a call and it depends on the nature of what the addition is whether a phone because when you're bound by the four corners later at a motion to suppress we prefer to have paper and proofread but we do them <clears throat> yeah. So I can see a uh, a policy. Uh, what are, what do we call those things? Package for uh, ways and means to get each of you at least one satellite phone. How's that? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Maybe this is another question for this group, but or at least a comment is anticipatory warrants for those things. I don't know if that's an option in some of these cases where you know there's likely the potential. Um, and if this is found, if if 
that would generate, but I don't know. Yeah, Trigger those are the things. Answer. Yeah, those are going to be the questions for the certified smart people, including Kurt and others, <laughs> as to uh, you know how far and how broad, and you know how comfortable you know your judge is going to be to allow for that. Now, I mean, it's clearly if you had a step process, if this is done, then you should. I'll be. Uh, uh, you know, uh, authorized to do the next or whatever it is, then it's just basically on your returns to be able to document that those things happen. Uh, but, you know, I, I, those are, you know, this is one of those situations I want to do what we can to make certain we get as much uh, latitude as you would need for these type of situations. But as we all know, uh, there's going to need to be some type of uh, sideboards and uh, checks and balances in there. Uh, to make certain uh, uh, the legislature as a whole uh, is comfortable for expanding that type of uh, authorization. All right, so regarding the execution of warrants, is there any other uh, items that you'd want to put on that? If not, I'm going to ask us to move into the, uh, the next one dealing with on the judicial uh, authority and procedure. All right, so I'm going to go back uh, to Sergeant Bechtel. Uh, I believe you also are going to give us a little presentation or opening for territorial authority of judges. Yeah, is my slideshow up again? Yeah, you're there. All right, so um, let's call this more of a discussion primer. Uh, I, I certainly have no... Um, solutions here. So what we're talking about is multiple jurisdiction issues. Increasingly, uh, we're dealing with um, drug trafficking organizations uh, as as marijuana teams. I'm sure the sheriff can attest. Uh, yes, we have individual locations that come to our attention and need to be addressed. But when we're out uh, doing our work, doing our enforcement work, we're we're looking to have the greatest impact, and so we're we're finding um, uh, grows that 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 are are part of an, a larger organization. What that means for my team up north, it's kind of a different animal. Uh, we have indoor grows, and our organizations will have several indoor grows. We have uh, multiple investigations ongoing, uh, with between fifteen and thirty locations for one organization. And we served warrants in September on 25 locations, all with one in one organization. So uh, you can't make everything a federal case is really what it comes down to. And that 25 location uh, uh, warrant we did. Um, and maybe to, to get back to Rep Morgan's uh, question on that one, we did uh, 25 search warrants in two days, but um, but the pace of one a week is uh, uh, investigating, setting it up, knocking it down. Um, you know, we had to we had to forego many weeks, if not months, to do 25 search warrants in two days. And um, we have one culminating next week that's uh, that's seven locations, and it's it's uh, of course a much shorter investigation. But just to uh, prime this discussion. Uh, we we lay out for uh, circuit court judges um, that they can issue a warrant outside of uh, their jurisdiction, and there's there's some pretty narrow um, um, reasons for them to be able to do that. Um, that's that's outlined really in one three three five four five, which you should see on the bottom of your screen, and, it, and it's basically telling us that if the if it's uh, uh, an offense committed or tribal within that judicial district, and there's there's objects of the search um, relating to it outside of their district. This comes into play a lot. We have a lot of um, people that live in uh, Portland or the Portland suburbs, but they're owning grows in rural counties in uh, uh, Clatsop, uh, um, Clackamas, Marion, Lynn, Polk, Yamhill. So so um, all of the documents are back there in Multnomah County, but the grows are in three or four different counties. And so the question becomes, um, who's who's going to take that? 
who's going to take specifically the conspiracy part of it, right? Um, because uh, that uh, that is that is what we're running into. Um, district attorneys are no different than police agencies right now. They are short on people. Um, and uh, and oftentimes that makes them short on experience and short on time and money. Uh, prosecuting crimes obviously costs money. So um, they're often not willing or able, is probably the better term, to authorize search warrants for grows outside of their county because they know that they can't uh, foot the bill for a prosecution. So this might be admittedly more of um, uh, an issue for that resource bucket that we were talking about earlier um, and more of a policy issue than uh, a statute change. Um, the 133545, it allows a Supreme Court justice, an appeals court justice, or a circuit court judge um, when evidence of, of the crime tribal in their county is outside of their county. And there's some exceptions, but the only exceptions are for elder abuse type crimes, um, just spitballing. What about an export um, or an exception for an export? That's one where, you know, really the export uh, uh, physically happens at a border. So um, I might catch it here in uh, Multnomah County because they put it in a in a in a, a mode of transportation for hire, I think is the statute. But um, you know, that physically happens out there. So there's kind of jurisdictional issues that really haven't um, been addressed. There's no case law um, or what I wanted to talk about. And again, I think maybe this is more of a policy issue. And so that's kind of my my summary there. All right, uh, feedback comments from others. Looks like uh, Courtney, your hand looked like, oh, Kurt is yours, sorry. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think it's both in uh, of the two th issues that Sergeant Bechtel was talking about. I'm going to let uh, Mr. Eastman talk more about the resource issue because he's going to be able to explain that quite well. Uh, I'll, and I'll add to Sergeant Bechtel's point, though, with with the change in priorities in law with um, the, I don't want to say full on decriminalization, but the decriminalization to a certain extent of drugs, it's really reduced the amount of experience in DA's offices because so, some DA's offices have disbanded units of their office that have, were more focused on drug crimes. So there is a lot lesser experience. And uh, speaking from my perspective, I was in Marion County before I was a DOJ and I was a drug crimes prosecutor for quite a number of years. And it took me a long time to figure out marijuana law um, just because it has so many different levels, right? Everything from um, a violation all the way up to a class A felony uh, for a marijuana crime. So it's something that takes a lot of experience in figuring out where the, the crime lies. So that kind of training piece also comes back into it. Talking about the the execution of the warrant and it relates to the getting the warrant from a judge. I think that should be expanded. I don't think I don't think the the rationale for limiting circuit court judges to their own judicial district really sticks around anymore. It's it's kind of anachronistic, right? It's a thing of the past. Um, police officers can, you know, um, and uh, what am I say? Enforce the laws of the state of Oregon anywhere in the state of Oregon, right? There's obviously reasons why the sheriff doesn't want his troops going three counties over to execute some sort of warrant. But you know what? If that other agency needs help, he has the authority to do so. He may pull them back in his county for the routine patrol stuff and not patrol other counties. But I think that's more of an issue for the agencies to address. And that's the same thing I, I think for the judges. I think our at least our circuit court judges should be have the same authority as the Supreme Court and the Court of Appeals to be able to issue a warrant anywhere within the state of Oregon. Um, and then they can handle their own policy issues for, hey, this whole crime is in another county. I'm not going to do it. Why do you want me to do that? And that's the same question I got asked to me often when I went to the Court of Appeals. Hey, judge, could you help us with this warrant? Why are you asking me about this and not the judge of that particular county? Um, right? So I don't think it should be built into the law as a restriction. It should be 
uh, up to the individual courts to do that. I do think that municipal court and uh, justice of the peace courts, though, should be limited to their own jurisdictions, because that's something that comes into play with not only the severity of the offenses, right, um, but also with just the resource issue um, when DAs would have a more understanding of circuit court judges around the state, but not so much on the municipal court judges, and they may have a little more hesitancy of, of arguing a motion to suppress from a municipal court judge versus a circuit court judge. So I think the one possible statutory fix to that would just be simply uh, moving circuit court judges up to the same level as the Supreme Court and Court of Appeals for um, issuing warrants anywhere within the state of Oregon. And then you could even just remove the whole subsection about elder abuse since it would be already um, built into the fact that the judge could do it anywhere in the state of Oregon. Uh, I think I covered everything that I had on that. All right, that's thank you for that explanation. Uh, yeah, and I would agree. I mean, we do need to remember that let's call them the junior courts are not within the state system. Uh, you know, it's quite interesting with SB 48 now up on the books and being uh, implemented. Uh, those questions, you know, have come up uh, around those uh, those courts that are not under the state court system. So I appreciate that pointing that out. Tyler, I see you're up. Yeah, just a question um, along those lines uh, for the certified smart people, as you say. I think uh, it was maybe a judge pro tem, uh, maybe uh, an appointed, not yet elected judge, um, who who uh, explained to me that she didn't believe that she had um, uh, authority as uh, uh, to to issue out of out of jurisdiction warrants, and she kicked it off to a full circuit court judge. Um, I I don't know if that's a thing. Um, uh, but I thought maybe Kirk yeah. would answer that. Uh, there is a subsection in there about pro tem judges, and if a duly appointed judge is not available, then a pro tem judge can uh, fill fill that role. I actually think that that should stay in there. Um, I think that the elected officials should be the ones with that statewide authority, but we do also know that there's oftentimes only one elected judge per district, and that judge maybe happens to be at a judicial conference and is unreachable, and they leave in their stead a pro tem. So I, I think the pro tem should still have the authority to issue warrants, but that pro tem maybe should be still limited to within their county. Um, but I don't know if maybe uh, Josh has any other thoughts on that or even the sheriff. So uh, I don't know. Go ahead, oh, Josh. Sorry. I, so I've never had the pro tem come up. I've had pushback on wanting to track. So like mobile tracking device outside of even the state. And I have always argued it under we're only monitoring in California to know when it is crimes tribal in our jurisdiction because they're bringing the drugs back to our jurisdiction. The the two see all my references with Jackson and WeWork and Madge is over here getting warrants and our guys go over there and get warrants. The only issue with doing that is that each county, as everybody knows, is a little different and judges want certain things and DA's offices want certain things. So even if we give the judges the authority to go outside, I think the the judges, there may be pushback because, oh, this is different than how we do it, or can you re run this by, like, our judges won't sign anything that we don't review, so just. All right. So, Dave, I know that you're monitoring. Uh, if you could maybe reach out to your uh, branch as to what might be issues at hand, it does make sense to me what I've heard Kurt say. You know, with the pro tem, there got to be the accountability, uh, and of course, the elected officials are that. And it looks like, and it sounds like that we, quote unquote, the legislature have already put in that safeguard uh, to limit what pro tems can do. Mm -hmm. But it does, at the same time, make sense that if you got a pro tem there for a period of time while a single circuit court judge is not, uh, you know, you don't want things to not be able to be acted upon just because their uh, categorization, but it seems to me that should be a default, I guess, uh, that if the uh, circuit court judge, he or she is not available, then a pro tem would be able to uh, act on that. But those again are concerns I uh, would raise this as others have to make certain we're not over uh, burdening the system or 
really having someone that may be uh, very inexperienced in this area making decisions that are going to be contrary to what you would expect out of uh, you know the a a circuit court judge. Right. Uh, thank you, Senator. Um, I would agree on the pro tem judge piece. I think th there's also there's also an issue with pro tem judges. Sometimes in particular counties, that they're appointed for specific purposes. They don't not necessarily given general jurisdiction, if you will, for everything. In a smaller county, if a judge like um, Kurt was saying is at the judicial conference for a couple of days, then somebody usually comes in, sits for them while they're out, and they have jurisdiction to to do whatever's been granted by the PJ, which I would assume includes the issuance and sign uh, of warrants. Um, and again, with um, electronic and telephonic warrants, um, you know, being being not in the county, the judge from that county certainly could respond to warrants, and I know that that they oftentimes do. Um, so I, I'm not so sure the pro tem judge issue is is really um, of too great a concern. Um, that an unavailability isn't a bigger issue. I think there may be some questions about moving circuit court judges or at least a conversation to be had about moving the circuit court judges up into the same category as Supreme Court and Court of Appeals judges in that they are elected to serve in the in the district or elected in within the districts in which they serve. And I think there's there's at least that when I was listening to the conversation just now, I could certainly see at least the specter of some sort of shopping for judges who sign warrants uh, to become an issue. Yeah, I mean, I, I I think that that could happen, but you also remember that judges are appointed by the governor when a seat vacates in between elections. So there's this mix between a state uh, appointment or an elected locally right. position. So that's that's kind of an interesting point. And then I guess my other question would be prosecutorial discretion and or judges not wanting to sign warrants and I get resources are a big deal uh, but should you know like should law enforcement if they're trying to uh, thwart criminal activity or intervene in criminal activity be able to be inhibited by you know say a district attorney's office or a judge's office that doesn't want to prosecute for resource reasons not there's not probable cause, right? I'm not talking about that. I'm yeah. talking like, yeah, you have plenty of evidence here. And yes, this is a crime, but we feel it's de minimis in our view. Should that be allowed? I mean, that's a question that I would say is should there should be some compelling through statute of if the thresholds are met for probable cause, you know, obviously DAs have prosecutorial discretion later, but to inhibit an investigation during the beginning and not allow it to go forward that seems to me as a, an overstep of of authority, right? Just because, yeah, we're not going to prosecute, so we're not going to sign off on your warrant, and then the judge isn't going to uh, sign it because, you know, the DA didn't buy off, or it's outside their jurisdiction, and yes, there's a nexus to the crime, but I'm not going to sign a warrant in Joe County because we don't have reason. I don't know. I just think that that, to me, that's, that's not what the law should be about or designed for. It shouldn't be those um barricades the police should yeah. do their thing and then the the da's and the judges should do their thing yeah you know but Nate, i think you bring up a very important part of that separation of on that authority uh, what i hear and what i think would be something that might be an advantage and uh, making some, some improvements is that if you are going to let's say think about expanding the jurisdiction or authority of the circuit court judges to the uh, appellate court uh, level of judges, maybe it needs to be limited or modified uh, with uh, the conduct being either directly in their county uh, or something on that. I'm just trying to think of something on a jurisdictional part because I'm not saying it's going to happen, but I think it is something that you, is going to be asked is why should someone in, I'm not going to name out a particular county, but a county that's in rural uh, Frontier Oregon be the person that uh, people go to get warrants for to be executed exclusively in county or counties within the uh, Willamette Valley. Senator, maybe uh, you could have it so long as 
prosecutable, you know, crime was committed, at least one crime was committed in that judge's county, right? So right. that right. would help with Sergeant Bechtel's issue with if it happens in three different counties instead of going to three different judges to get warrants in those counties. Yeah. Because I can think of plenty of circumstances where you have lots of crimes in one county, but then you have a whole nother business with a whole nother entity. And if you're not thinking about RICO, then that's only in the other county. But so long as stuff happens in one county, then that judge can now authorize it in other counties. Right. Yeah. So I feel can I ask a question? Oh, I'm sorry sure. to interrupt. I apologize. No, Kurt, is that, how is that different than, um, than sub two? And maybe I'm not just reading it closely enough. Because sub two contemplates only if you're getting evidence from the other county for prosecution in your county. But what if some of those crimes only occurred in the other county? They can't be prosecuted in your county. I still think that the judge, so long as you have some crimes that can be prosecuted in your county, they should be able to authorize to go out and get warrants to for the other county to bring evidence into yours and then also to go bring evidence in another county. Thank so you. Let me just yeah, before we go to Tyler on that one, Kurt, I'd also think that there'd be some type of nexus between that activity to what is happening in the county that you seek the warrant in as as compared to something that's completely separate, distinct, same actor, but not maybe intertwined with uh, the other conduct in the multiple counties. Yeah, I agree. That makes sense. I'm also thinking, honestly, Senator, about uh, another committee that on the DUI side is commit is considering doing a statewide process for telephonic warrants and and moving judges. So I think we'll you'll see some bleed over as we get into the next session on this from two different topic areas. All right, Tyler, go ahead. Yeah, so I I, I think Kurt hit it on the head. So I've got a I've got farms in all different counties. And um, th there's a real resistance. Uh, I might know they're related on paper, through bank records, through ownership, but that manufacturer, unlawful manufacturer of marijuana happens wholly in another county. And that's really where we're getting the resistance from district attorneys. They want to hold that out as another case. And um, and that that cell of uh, the conspiracy and uh, more importantly, the RICO, uh, the racketeering is hard. Um, if you want to see a DA run, say racketeering like there is some there's some really rough case law for them. And um, uh, so, yeah, it's it's but it, but it's you know, it's uh, marijuana crimes are listed as a, as a predicate offense for a racketeering for a reason. And I'm telling you when I'm looking at millions of dollars of real estate, uh, 20 co-conspirators, things that are going on for two years, that's what it is. And if I really want to address this problem for the state, and if I really want to honor Measure 91 that says we want to keep organized crime out of Oregon, then I have to be able to scrape all the cancer out. I can't just play whack-a-mole. Yeah. So Josh, I mean, I know you're here from my perspective as an ODA type representative. So I think this is something that you should maybe get back with the, the association as to, you know, how people are feeling because they're, as you are, everyone's a, an individual elected official. And I, what I'd hate to see is a uh, necessary a separation in the agent and the association to the point of where uh, we're not going to be fruitful in moving forward something okay and uh, racketeering is exciting i did one i think it's it's great so much evidence comes in so i don't know who's afraid of it it's so. well, well we'll give you names after we're not recording <laughs> and All if right. you say that too much uh you're gonna get plucked to doj because yeah. they're really the only ones <laughs> Yeah, we're not ready to lose you down in Southern Oregon. That's the point. So uh, other comments and stuff, uh, we're doing great on time. I just want to see what else we might want to be covering while we are still together today. Right, Michael, what is it that we you need or you'd like for us to provide you that you may have missed so far? Sure. I, from my my seat, I think we're pretty good. I've been taking some pretty copious notes, and I uh, I think one of my next steps, I'll uh, get together with um, Rob Bovet and see if we can kind of map out a 
at least kind of, you know, I know we've talked about some potential language here, but kind of get his thoughts and see where we yeah. might go. Yeah, I, I will uh, commission and charge you to do that uh, and get Brother uh, Bovet and engaged in this. Lily, I, I want to just check in with you. We've had some response to some of the question that you put out there. Is there more to that question that you want us to keep uh, uh, into the, the mix for uh, further discussions later? Honestly, I only ask it for the sake of making sure we have the most available to our teams that they need. Okay. So I'm going to trust on our law enforcement partners, our DA, and um, to say it's not enough or it's all we can do. It's no, we need more. So um, I just want to make sure that we're having those conversations that if there's more we have to discuss, it's on the table, but it's it's not because I personally need it. OK, no, that sounds fine. I appreciate that clarification for the record, that is. All right, folks, what else did you want to cover today? I really appreciate uh, our uh, efficiency of getting through the two topics today. Michael, I don't have uh, our next meeting scheduled uh, as to time. I know that you got that on the agenda for, I believe it's next month or the end of this month. Yeah, so the, the full group is, as everyone knows, is meeting tomorrow. Um, yep. at 10 a.m. I think and then our next currently our next scheduled subcommittee meeting is um, June 29th or excuse me August 29th I think I okay think. <laughs> it's the 29th one of the months okay we'll figure out which month but it's the 29th okay all right uh, if there's not any other parting words I want to thank you all very much for taking the hour and a little bit uh, to uh, get through our material today uh, tomorrow we'll have, as um, Michael said, the full meeting. Uh, many will see tomorrow, and if not, be safe, be well, and uh, stay hydrated. We're starting to get our summer heat in, and uh, got to take care of ourselves. All right, goodbye, everyone, and uh, we'll see those tomorrow, and then uh, our next uh, subcommittee meeting, and uh, see you later. Thank you. Thank you.